Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to op-ed.tv. You would think that someone who was a socialist feminist would be a pretty safe Bernie Sanders supporter in the Democratic presidential primaries. But a pair of articles that captured the cover of The Nation magazine make it clear that this is not automatically the case. The authors, both feminists who are also socialists, have decidedly different views and they're here to discuss them. Liza Featherstone, editor of False Choices, the faux feminism of Hillary Clinton, is a solid Bernie Sanders supporter. But Susanna Danuta Walters, director of women's gender and sexuality studies at Northeastern University, who is joining us via Skype, has come down on the other side and is supporting Hillary Clinton. So we'll have at it. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having us. Uh, let's start by looking at the concept of socialism. Bernie Sanders calls himself a democratic socialist. So, uh, Liza, what does that mean, and, and how is that any different from, say, your mainstream liberal Democrat? Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, if you were to ask some of my um, farther left friends, they would say <laughs> it's no different, right? I mean, that, that you know, that Bernie basically is uh, um, a, a liberal Democrat. Um, I, I don't see it that way. I think um, um, that while um, socialism to many socialists means um, that workers own the means of production, that they own um, right. they own the factory, they own the cafe, or you know, I guess in a service economy, they would own the Starbucks. Um, <laughs> um, and um, and um, obviously, I. Um, I'm, well, not maybe not so obviously. Um, I think that would be great. I am a socialist, <laughs> um, but um, but that is not the kind of socialist that Bernie Sanders is. Bernie Sanders is a um, a social democrat. Um, he advocates um, for um, socializing a lot of things, which means making a lot of things public goods that um, human beings need: health care, um, education. Um, you know, childcare, right. um, things like that, um, that um, are um, commodified um, in our society, um, but are um, public goods, the government-funded um, things that everyone has access to in um, in social democracies such as Sweden or Denmark. Um, Susanna Broadly, would you uh, agree with that? And do you think that there is a significant difference from Bernie's kind of socialism? and um, the liberal Democrat as we've come to know it? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I generally agree with what, what Lies is saying here. I think Bernie, you know, I think one can uh, parse and pick through the, the language here. Um, I mean, I see Bernie very much as a sort of New Deal, liberal, progressive Democrat. Uh, call it a social Democrat, call it a, you know, a sort of Scandinavian-style Democrat, socialist. I mean, it, they're all fairly similar. Um, and, and in that, there is an American tradition with that. And, you know, he has, as I've always felt, um, you know, very important points of overlap with that tradition and with Hillary Clinton and points of real differentiation um, where his both his rhetoric and and what he um, what he what he argues that he'll actually be able to get done are really quite different. So, I, you know, I think they both um, both uh, Clinton and Sanders um, have points of real commonality that are often overlooked in some of this debate. So, Susanna, you're supporting Hillary Clinton, who is decidedly not a socialist. Tell no. us why. <laughs> well, for a lot of reasons. And I, and I always say, and, and Liza and I have done this a few times now, so mm -hmm. she's heard it, but I'm, <laughs> yeah. not, you know, I'm really not interested in bashing Bernie, in being uh, bashed back by Bernie folks. Um, I really do believe that we need to keep our eyes on the prize and that the, the, the Republicans are one scarier than the next. Uh, the top three are, you know, are really um, a, a trio of nightmare there. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, I do think actually last night was, was heartening to see how close they were. Last night uh, was the Iowa caucus. The Iowa caucus to see how close Bernie and Hillary uh, came to each other. And I think their speeches uh, were generous to each other. And they're holding a substantive and reasonable uh, and civic and civil debate unlike their opponents. So, you know, but my support for Hillary runs a wide range of reasons. Um, a lot of it having to do with uh, my agreement with both her policies and with her ability to get them done 
in, an, in a climate that is decidedly conservative, in which the Republicans have taken over the House and Senate and most state legislatures and most governorships. And there's not a lot of chance that that's going to change in the immediate future. So I am, um, you know, anticipating that, that if Bernie um, is elected, and I don't think he's unelectable. I think that argument is, uh, you know, it's one I'm, I'm skeptical of, frankly. Um, but I think he will face much more pushback than he even he imagines. And so I am interested in what we can actually get done. And I think Clinton has shown herself to be someone who is tenacious, um, uh, particularly under fire. She has spent most of her adult life under fire. Um, but I also think that the, the value added of having a woman break that glass ceiling, of having a woman in an office, which has not been held by a woman in, oh, lo, these over 200 years. Never. It is right. enormous. I mean, it was enormous with Obama. It, you know, it meant so much to so many in ways that I think we can't even begin to unpack at this point. And I, so I don't think symbols are ever merely symbols. Um, I, you know, I think if Hillary were anything like a Sarah Palin or a Fiorina <laughs> or a Margaret Thatcher, of course right. I wouldn't want her. She is someone whose uh, belief system is, is one I find a lot of commonality with, a lot of differences as well. Um, but I find that would be true with anyone. I have differences with Bernie. You know, I wish he were more of a socialist. I wish he were tougher <laughs> on guns. Uh, I wish that his um, his commitments to gender equity seemed deeper and more more um, invested in his philosophy. Uh, so, you know, I think he's terrific. I think she's terrific. Um, um, but I do think we need to we need to finally finally um, get something like parity here. Uh, Liza, your take, of course, is different. So tell us. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I definitely agree with Susanna that this this democratic contest has been fascinating and very focused on issues, and that in itself is really heartening. I mean, to, right. um, as as part of our our democratic process, um, small D and big D. Um, I um, yeah, I, I guess I think that Susanna's um, um, I really. Um, identified our, our main point of disagreement, which is um, on the value of having a woman um, as um, president um, just to me does not override um, the, um, the, the, the philosophical um, d um, differences that I see between those two candidates um, and, and my conviction that the kind of politics that, um, um, that Sanders is um, espousing that his candidate candidacy helps to build a movement for um, you know um, is those are really the kind of politics that I think would improve um, the lot of the vast majority of women in this country um, and 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 I think um, one of the things that's um, important to me about that is I I think that um, Gender and economics are just so intertwined, you know that um, that you um, you can't um, really um, you really can't really um, make a society in which the vast majority of women can advance, um, in which more things are not socia socialized, right? Your contention is that the economic policies, which are the cornerstone of the mm -hmm. Sanders campaign would be much more beneficial to women yes. than the policies espoused by Hillary Clinton. Definitely. Um, uh, Susanna, do you agree or disagree with that? It, or it's, is it's a very interesting question. I agree to some extent. I mean, I do think if, if Sanders were elected and he actually were, was, was able to get through some of the things he's planning, which is a big, big if, uh, right. all of those are big ifs, uh, then, then it could certainly benefit women. Obviously, it would benefit everybody. But I do think uh, there's an underlying difference here that, that Liza and I have. And it's often seen as a difference between a kind of old left um, position and positions that are more intersectional or, or really understand that race and class and gender are mutually constitutive. They're not, they're not set in a hierarchy. And so I think there is a kind of underlying discourse in the Sanders um, framework, which is 
once we beat back that 1%, you know, once we, we get some, uh, you know, re refigure the playing field and, and make, it, make it more equal and, you know, take on Wall Street, then all the rest, all those other inequalities will somehow fall into place, that they, they are fundamentally tied to this economic inequity. Now, I think economic inequity that we have is horrific and unethical in every possible way. But I do not believe, and history has not shown us, that, that if, in fact, we had a really socialized system of medicine or a socialized system of education, that somehow that would do away with masculinist ideologies, with racist ideologies, with uh, sexual violence, with domestic violence. In fact, not at all. But and we know that historically, that, that it yep. hasn't happened. So I do think there is a, a real, there is a divide here between a, a um, you know, an economic justice um, in a narrow sense, fixes all, and a more intersectional kind of way of understanding, um, particularly race and gender and how they play out. Liza? Well, I would say um, nobody's arguing that um, if you take care of um, economics that race and, um, race and gender um, oppressions would, would disappear. Um, actually, um, I think the argument I'm making is more intersectional because I'm arguing that class and economics literally intersect um, and that it is very um, difficult um, for, that, um, that, um, that poverty magnifies the oppression that women endure. I mean, just as, um, just as class and race um, literally um, intersect. I mean, that, um, you know, when, you know, when, when Sander, Sanders sometimes points out um, how, that his, um, his policies would greatly benefit African Americans. And, um, and, and that is true, because economics and race um, um, also intersect. So um, I, I don't think anybody is really arguing that, um, that um, you know, somehow if you take care of the economics, all the other problems um, will be solved. Um, I, I, I do think, in fact, um, that um, it's um, many of the Clinton supporters, Susanna not included, um, that, that seem to argue that um, we should um, ignore, that we should focus on the gender triumph of Hillary Clinton and ignore all the other issues. Conservatives will most often say that we've made tremendous progress, um, or women have made tremendous progress in this country over the past half century or more, uh, so much so that it really shouldn't make much of a difference whether it's a, a woman or a man who's elected president. What's your response to that? Oh, I think that's clearly <laughs> foolish, and I think Suzanne and I can agree yeah, on we, that. Yeah, we agree on that one. Yeah. I mean, you know, the fantasy that somehow we're in this post-feminist, or by the way, post-racial, because, oh, we have That's what they said when Obama back. was elected, right. right. Yeah, here we go, end of racism, you know? <laughs> Uh, that worked out real well, um, you know, and, and certainly we wouldn't, um, uh, not only would we not see the end of uh, male dominance with the election of Hillary, but of course, one of the things we're seeing now, and, and I think it behooves us all to pay attention to this, and of course, not surprising, um, is the kind of, um, uh, you know, resurfacing, bubbling over, uh, however you want to put it, of out-and-out -out misogyny and more um, circuitous forms of sexism that are cropping up. So maybe this time around, people aren't saying, hey, hey, lady, why don't you iron my shirts that they said last time to Hillary. But there's still some of the kind of dismissal, of double standards, of, you know, a, 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 a woman, a strong woman, and a woman politician is in a patriarchal culture in a structurally different position. It's as simple as that. And uh, by the way, I would say the same thing. It'll be interesting if, if Bernie is, in fact, the nominee. What will happen with his atheism mm -hmm. and what will happen with his Jewish identity Definitely. will be really mm -hmm. interesting. It hasn't been talked about a lot yet, but I think that the kind of anti-Semitism that will circus, sur surface up will be terrifying. Uh, atheism, yes. anti-Semitism, and socialism right. has, uh, <laughs> no, have not listen, been talked a lot about a, yet. A, a yeah. bevy of minority wins here <laughs> in uh, yeah. the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, Donald Trump, um, if not the leading GOP candidate, certainly one of the leading uh, GOP candidates at this point, um, has had um, one um, degrading statement after another 
uh, with regard to uh, women. Can each of you just um, give me a sense of how you view his approach to women and, and the fact that his candidacy is doing so well, even though he has that approach. Uh, Susanna, why don't we start with you? Well, I think it is doing so well because it has that approach. And I think that is, if we don't pay attention to, to that, um, you know, just like if we don't pay attention to the fact that most of mass shootings and domestic terrorism is done by young white men, um, you know, we, we, we don't see the way gender politics actually plays out. So it's not that he's doing well in spite of his misogyny. It's that he is making legitimate and explicit a kind of misogyny that's never gone away, alas. And, you know, the ways in which um, the, the press has actually given him pretty much of a pass on it says, oh, yeah, it's so bad he said that, but let's focus on him some more and let's, let's cut to Trump, mm -hmm. you know, speaking again, uh, is really... Um, a testament to the ways in which a, a kind of banal and everyday sexism is considered business as usual. Uh, Liza, your, th your thoughts about Trump? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I should say I was extremely puzzled at first by Trump's um, vendetta against Megyn Kelly, the Fox <laughs> News, because right. I, I just, I thought, why would he be attacking the most likable conservative in public life. <laughs> I mean, this woman is um, is very intelligent. She has a very um, charismatic personality, and she's very pretty. So, like those, I mean, that <laughs> seems like a, a foolish um, person to make the target of, of, of your attack. And um, a friend of mine who had studied the right wing um, extensively um, said, "No, you're missing the point. Um, that is exactly who he is going to go after because." His base is um, his his base is sexist, you know. I mean, and right. and and they don't value her, even though she's. It doesn't make a difference that she's conservative. Um, I mean, it's like, and um, and um, and many conservative women might also resent a woman in public life um, in that way. So he might e not even be alienating um, conservative women in the way that I would have right. expected. So I mean, there's. There's there's a lot to unpack here about Trump, and um, hopefully, um, <laughs> we won't have to do it for that much longer. Um, but um, it's um, it's it's a disturbing phenomenon. Well, except sure. I should say, I mean, even though you know the other candidates, the other leading candidates, made some sort of motions occasionally to saying, oh, that's not so nice to talk about people that way. You know, there has not been this. Whole, you know, whole scale repudiation. No, of no, there is not. I agree. Of, no. of, of the racist the press, language. The press has the, not done that. No, the the press hasn't done it. Uh, the Republican Party hasn't done it. Um, I mean, this, you know, this kind of xenophobic, um, you know, nativist, sexist kind of discourse is is absolutely business as usual for the for the Republican Party. And for their base, and we need to reckon with that if we're going to actually win this election. Um, a question for each of you first about Hillary, and then about um, Bernie. Um, Hillary is uh, constantly battling what some uh, have characterized as an authenticity um, problem, and um, a lot of people find that she is not trustworthy. Uh, Susanna, I'll start with you. Uh, do you have any concerns along these lines, or, or do you think that those criticisms are overblown? I think they're overblown and they're sexist. I really do. I have to tell you. I mean, I think, you know, this question, this focus on personality, on likability, on authenticity, on realness, on trustworthiness has a gender edge to it. I think that particularly for older women and older men, there really is a double standard here. And I think Bernie can very well be, and not just Bernie, but other older men. I mean, look at look at anchors on television. You know, they can be the grand statesman, the grandfatherly, but also, accepted. you know, sage wisdom. Uh, and I think women are older women are put in a terrible double bind in that. Liza. Yeah, um, I, I agree with a lot of what Susanna just said. I mean, I I don't like to criticize um, Hillary Clinton's. Um, character or, um, or or personality and in fact um, there's nothing about that in the collection I edited <laughs> false choices we specifically we very deliberately um, stayed away from that for some of the um, reasons for some of the reasons that Susanna mentioned and also it just wasn't important to any of us um, I mean the um, um, I, I, I would say though um, there's the 
authenticity is a broad word, and it also does cover. Um, I think when um, you know when people say, um, "I don't really trust her." Um, they may be being sexist, they may be holding a woman to a double standard, but they may also be referring to the fact that this woman has been a political insider for a very, very long time and espousing um, a, um, a, um, a very mainstream ideology and, very, and is very close to very powerful special interests that have not been making our world better. You know, so, so there's, there's sort of authenticity as personality, but there's also um, some, I mean, p people may be responding to right. the fact that she is, she just is the consummate insider, and it's, this is at a time that um, people are perhaps starting to feel very critical of the elite. Uh, we're down to our last minute or so. On Bernie, um, much of the criticism from folks on the left actually, is that um, many of the things he's proposing are perceived as pie in the sky. So universal health care, free college tuition, some other things. Um, folks are saying that uh, in the present atmosphere especially, uh, they'll never see the light of day. Is that a legitimate concern? You know, um, I think from a purely policy um, point of view, um, it, it is. Um, and I, um, but I think that... Um, um, we need to take a, a view of politics that is not purely about elites. I mean, that, um, that in order for anything to change, you also need to build movements. And, um, and people organizing for Bernie, people knocking on doors and really talking to um, their neighbors about um, what is democratic socialism, what should government actually do for people, um, I think um, that's exactly what is needed. And um, Sanders has said himself, I, wouldn't, I won't be able to enact um, this agenda unless this movement continues. And I, and I think that um, for movements to continue, they need victories. And I think that um, I, I think electing Sanders would be a great victory for a movement to build on. Uh, Susanna, very uh, uh, quickly, are you concerned um, about how realistic some of Bernie's uh, proposals are. I am. I mean, I think it's a reasonable thing to, to ask whether or not, I think the healthcare one is a great example. I mean, I am have always been a supporter of universal healthcare. I think it's criminal that we're the only advanced industrial society that doesn't have it. I couldn't agree with him more. I actually believe that Hillary Clinton believes the same thing. Her history shows it. I don't think she is opposed to that. I think the question uh, of strategy, of whether or not you know, opening up the debate, trying to get a Medicare for all version of universal health through this kind of a Congress after it has attempted to repeal um, the Affordable Care Act more than any other bill in history, I think, I do wonder about that just on a purely pragmatic, realistic basis. I would hate to see us lose what we have. Um, I would like to see it improved. I would like to see it completely Medicare for all, but I actually am not sure if that's reasonable in this context. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Um, that, but I do think it's a reasonable discussion to have. On that note, we have run out of time. I wish we could talk uh, more. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. If the Republican campaign for president was a movie, it would undoubtedly be part of the Dumb and Dumber series. There are many reasons for this, but let's focus for a moment on global warming. Last year was the hottest in the Earth's recorded history by a wide margin. The previous hottest year was the year before. We've had plenty of warning. Back in the year 2000, I wrote in a column that the decade of the 1990s was most likely the hottest of the 20th century. And 1998 was, at that time, the hottest year ever recorded. The oceans are rising, I said. Mountain glaciers are shrinking. Low-lying coastal areas are eroding. And the very timing of the seasons is changing. I noted that scientists were saying all indications were that the warming of the Earth in the 21st century would be significantly greater than it was in the 20th. That was more than 15 years ago. And of course, all of it turned out to be true. We're in trouble here. We're headed toward a global catastrophe. But the Republican candidates for president don't think so. On global warming, Donald Trump said, 
I am not a believer, adding, I believe there's weather. I believe there's change, and I believe it goes up, and it goes down, and it goes up again. Ted Cruz said, contemptuously, climate change is the perfect pseudoscientific theory for a big government politician who wants more power. When Marco Rubio was asked if he would support regulations to lower harmful emissions, he said no. I don't believe we have to destroy our economy, he said, in order to protect our environment. Even Jeb Bush, supposedly more enlightened than some of the other candidates, said this about climate change. There's someone in a garage somewhere who will eventually have a clue. That'll solve the problem. Someone in a garage somewhere. Dumb and dumber playing soon at a polling place near you. That's all for now. See you next time.